How's it? Hang loose. Aloha and welcome. Alimai. This is Mongoose Max Hawaii, the channel. And this is my ukulele, which I should practice more often. <sighs> and this is a kahili. This is a kahili. Oh, the, the kahili <sighs> is significant in Hawaiian culture. And this is a uh, actually a rooster, rooster, kind of, kind of feather duster. And this is a painting I did of Jesus after the uh, Leonardo da Vinci Last Supper, kind of copied. Let's see if I can do some oil painting and a chart of ukulele, of course. I'm introducing you to these little items because we're in for a little bit of a lecture. I'm going to try something different here because I had this question in my mind, kind of like from when I was a kid, about the difference between mana and the Christian Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost from the Trinity and Christianity. So what we're going to do here is explore two books a little bit. One is written by kind of like compiled by uh, Saint John Paul II, the uh, Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. Whatever is in this book, the church, Roman Catholic Church teaches. If it's not really in, if you say something or talk about something and it's not like con conforms to what's in this book, it's heresy or what the church doesn't teach. Heresy, it doesn't teach it. Doctrine, that's what the church teaches. Consequences were different in the past, but you know, that's all it really means. And this book here, this one, Ban Gods and Nature by a Michael Keone Dudley, PhD, who taught Hawaiian religion at Chaminade since 1975. And he's also a scholar activist deeply involved in the sovereignty movement. So here's source one, here's source two. There's Dudley and Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> because we want to look at what mana is. And you don't want it just from me as a source. So uh, I'd put on my anthropology thinking hat, but it makes my little Indiana Jones hat makes me look like a leprechaun, so we don't get the St. Patrick going on. What my view of mana, I picked that I am not Hawaiian, not a smidgen, just grew up here since I was a little kid. I have lots of Hawaiian friends. Well, I don't, con not in total contact with them all the time, but I learned that mana is basically spiritual power it's uh, it's spiritual in nature and it's a force like a power and the elites or the chiefs would have more mana and the kamaaina or commoners might pick up some mana but whenever the elite went by they would prostrate themselves and go ha ah, breath of life ha ah, which puts any mana they collected, throws it onto the king, giving the king or chief mana. And if they didn't do that, like the first contact settlers, <laughs> Captain Cook, etc., those types of people, they were considered without ha, without breath, or haoli. So that became white man or foreigner. They didn't do that to the king or the elite chief. And of course, there's contact with white people 
or Caucasian people from the Western civilization, and the earliest ones were missionaries, who were professing and converting many to uh, Christianity. Roman Catholic is the first Christianity, but it wasn't, I don't think, the first Christianity here. There's like different varieties of Christianity. This one has a long tradition. This is the Christianity I go by, the Roman Catholic. But there was Protestant Christianity, and the Hawaiians looked at it like they, their ali'i chief, ali'i du'aloa, their big chief, was throwing out the old kapu system. You know, chief says what you can and cannot do, what's forbidden, kapu. They threw in, they're throwing that out with, I think it was King Kamehameha III. And Christianity was more of the replacement. Instead of being pushed on them, they adopted it more. And they would say that they took Christianity and improved on it. <laughs> but here's what was interesting. This mana, this spiritual power, it, to me, sounded a lot like Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. What's the difference between mana and the Holy Spirit? You know? Now, these are worldviews involving beliefs. That's why I said put on the anthropology hat. We're doing comparative religion of world views or world concepts and beliefs. Now, if you're in ancient Hawaii or even back in the 1700s, you really, really would believe this. So the concept is believed in. And what's true for them is what they believe. It's true. It's true for them. At least you know that. Can you say the same thing about Christianity? Yeah, you can. If you believe it, then it's true. But if you uh, are not believer or atheist or agnostic, then you're still not putting your belief behind it. But it's still a concept. So we can look at the two concepts, <clears throat> hopefully without getting into too much heresy or blasphemy for myself, because I am Roman Catholic, <laughs> but I know some about mana. But we'll take it from the source. So first we're going to look at the gods and nature. And here we go. In this chapter here, Akua, Mana, and Divinity. Now in this one, Akua, right? A-K-U-A. Wait, A-K-U-A. Yes. Akua is translated as sentient spirit. It has a mind, as a consciousness, a spirit consciousness. What does it have to do with divinity? Because ancient Hawaii, they had gods, polytheism. They had bigger gods, lesser gods, original ancestral gods, smaller gods, amakua, guardian spirit guards, gods. So the difference between maybe a person with mana and a akua or spirit is that the common akua and the divine akua seem to be that the divine akua has greater amount of mana spiritual power so the difference is how much mana you have there's a difference between a minor god and a person see a person when they die they have a soul called uhane now the uhane is this <clears throat> like newborn soul into the afterlife right? after death they're in the afterlife the ahua they're weak they they need guidance and that's why the burial practices of ancient Hawaiians is so significant and special and a <clears throat> definitely important in the belief system. And the person's soul becomes an akua, a spirit, a conscious spirit. Now, the conscious spirit would be much like the person was when they were alive. If they were, you know, like that, you know, and they'd be like that in the afterlife. Or if they were a nice person they'd be like a nice person in the afterlife and it's important because ancestors like uh, 
earlier on in the family tree and these people could be a kua that look guide and protect the living person and depending on how much mana they have makes a difference between how much of a great spirit there is okay that's just a little bit now in the ancient Hawaiians when a person dies the the material stuff you know the the flesh and blood and skin and bones and all that the guts all of that is different then there's a different distinction between what is in the spirit realm and what is in the physical realm the actual actual physicality of it like uh, this is kukaili moku right so in these uh well, tiki's are uh, ili. I think ili the, the the idols, these statues that they carve. There's actually be like big six foot, maybe ten foot statues. Now, when they carve these statues, and they do ritual, and they pule pray, and ritual and offerings, it brings the spirit into the object, and the object it 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 embodies what the object is. So. Kukaili Moku would come into the the idol and it, and it would be like that. Similar to a person. A person has their their uha, uhane, the soul, is inside the person. And their akua embodies what is inside the person physically. They're, anyhow, the bones are the significant thing see because there's this spirit world and then there's the hard concrete world and there's definitely a distinction and when a person dies make they in ritual practice or burial funerary practice they would try to separate the flesh from the bone in different ways different methods <clears throat> Sometimes they just let them, you know, and a lot of times there's preparation. But separation, where they get the bones and they would place them together. And when the bones are placed in one spot, offerings were offered. Food, drink, what they needed in life. So they feel comfortable. Their akua of the person comes and resides in the bone, much like it resides in... Um, in an idol uh, statue. <clears throat> See, I'm crossing over. So, the spirit, mana, the spirit, and the spirit goes into where the bones are. They hang out with the bones so the ancestors can be comforted with the uh, ancestor or their relatives, basically. In the bones and the offering and stuff the mana is projected into that anyhow it gets a little complicated so no that seems so what is that heathen pagan or what what is Christianity more like Catholicism say about that I mean is this that much different because when Catholics say holy, right? I think the best definition of holy, which is kind of different than I thought, was something that's set apart. It's set apart. It's set aside. It's made special. Like, that's special. And it's special because it's given or dedicated to God. So here's God. This is God's stuff. Not my stuff. It belongs to you know, deals with God. And God is perfect, holy. And when you have the spirit of God or the presence of God interacting with objects, there's basically a, a holy residual. There's, if God made direct contact or even secondary contact with things in God's creation, there would be a residual holiness 
there. So, when they have, uh, oh, let's see, I don't have anything uh, within my reach, but if there was, um, this is, this rosary goes broken, but if there was a rosary, and there is a crucifix here, and a, this is a hematite rosary, and so I was praying the rosary, I'm pule, praying. And I'm asking for intercession of God's Holy Spirit. So I'm praying this and asking God to get closer. And here's the ritual prayer object. So there's something about a residual holiness to crucifixes and prayer I can people what people use to pray with and churches, sacred grounds, and sacred too. It just means that that place is reserved for God. It doesn't belong to me or to these people. The people are using it saying, this is God's stuff. And when you have saints, which is an interesting concept because we're gonna get into this a little bit. Saints are just a Christian person that did Christianity so well that the church deemed it, declared it, that this person did Christianity right is a great example, and they are definitely, if we know anything about anything, in the heaven realm. So when they died, they went to heaven for sure, as far as us lay people understand. Now, regular people, eh, maybe, maybe not, some good, some bad, nah, nah, nah. who am I to judge, all that kind of thing, that person went to hell, that person went to heaven, who do I know, but what do I know? But God knows, and the whole church declares, this Roman Catholic Church is declaring that that person did a saintly life, there is example of miracles, intercession from God, and that person's in heaven. So. Therefore, I can intercede prayers, have that person, well, I pray to, toward, let's say toward, I pray, I pray toward the saint to intercede for me with God, or Jesus Christ, or the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the Holy, most Holy Trinity. See, because I know they're in heaven. I'm not doing an Ouija board thing where I don't know what spirit I'm talking to. I know that person is bound in the heaven gang. They're in the heaven choir. So when I pray to that person or toward that person, I'm saying, come here. I know you're in heaven. Could you give God a prayer for me? Because if they intercede, they're more holy than I can be right now and God might get closer to my prayer. And that is the main thing about intercession of saints. We're not praying to the saint. We're kind of calling, even the first saint, I believe is uh, Mary, Jesus's mother. I believe she's considered the first saint, I think. I could be wrong, I don't know. I hope I'm not making heresy, but, but she's kind of like the first saint, I always thought. and. When the prayer, Hail Mary, full of grace, is something um, an angel said. So they're including that in the prayer. When they say, Hail Mary, well, if we see that prayer, it's hail, come over here. Yo, over here. Hail Mary. Yo, over here. Hail Mary. Which Mary? The one full of grace. Right? Identifying exactly who we want to talk to. Hail Mary, come on over here like hailing a taxi is that wrong to say that <laughs> but kind of like it's, it's the same use of the word and when we do that we're hailing the saints in the intercession thing but what am i saying what am i going off about saints for because they're considered holy people and what is with that well you know it's like the bones of saints are relics they're relics and what's a relic you know, there's the real relic, there's a big, 
there was a big thing about relics in history <clears throat> and a lot of counterfeit relics. That aside, the idea of a relic is there's first degree relic. For with saints, it's like they're bones. Here's the finger bone of Saint Anthony or the jaw bone of Saint whoever, Alfonso. Uh, saint uh, Father Damien. Seth Father Damien de Vustu, he's a saint now, the Molokai priest. So these people, their bones are the highest form of relic because they're a holy person and what's left, what remains, the relic of them is bone. So they have a little piece of bone and they put it in the altar and it's something they can count on being holy. Second tier or second degree relic is something that the saint touched in life. So maybe it's their tunic, it was on them, their eyeglasses, their cane that they walked with maybe. Something that they used, they were touching. And that can be a secondary route. You see these little pieces of like little cloth that's not bone. Why? Why do relics like that? And why bone? Well, the holy residual. Let me see if I can find this. Now, the Holy Spirit had a title. And... It, the Holy Spirit had a title. And Jesus would say, the paraclete, for mentioning the Holy Spirit. The paraclete literally means, he who is called to one's side. Come on. Holy Spirit, come here. Vini Sancti Spiritus, Latin for come Holy Spirit. The paraclete, come on over to one side. Now this is the Spirit of God, which is also God, but it's also a person, an akua with consciousness, a spirit the entity of the most holy magnitude because they have the Trinity. All three are three different persons, all three are God, but they're not each other. It's one of those Holy Trinity things. Mystery. <laughs> no, can't really quite figure it out. But Jesus called the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit the Paraclete, one who is called to one side and also called the Spirit of Truth. Now, I did say Paraclete, not Parakeet, because Parakeet's a bird and Holy Spirit's known as a dove. Doves aren't Parakeets. Paraclete. Okay, now, in Genesis area of the Bible, God creates creation with his breath, and there's every living thing and creature, and the, it belongs to the Holy Spirit to rule. This is out of Catechism 703. Sanctify animate creation for he the Holy Ghost Paraclete is God consubstantial with the Father and the Son power over life pertains to the Spirit for being God he preserves creation in the Father through the Son and also whenever there's the Holy Spirit there is a uh, it's God sends Jesus Christ to do a mission, salvation. And when God sends his son, he also sends the Holy Spirit. Actually, Jesus is a sort of dispensing a little bit of his Holy Spirit. And when he dies and is resurrected and ascends to heaven, he says, hang around. I'm going to send this gift to you, which is the Holy Spirit. This is Pentecost, 50 days after the ascension. So Jesus, when his mission is over, sends the Holy Ghost to be with us. Oh, this is all fair and well, okay. Uh, I didn't come here for church or Sunday school, right? Well, what's the difference here? Here we go with Akua, Mana, and Divinity. Now, the ancient Hawaiians knew that Mana would concentrate in the bones after a person perishes. 
Like all Akua, indwelling species of nature, that's when they're inside, the species would be... Uh, would be some some car form or the person themselves species of uh, matter so they assume the limitations determined by the physical form of the species it has entered the person or the whatever but once separated from the dead human body and freed of its constraints the soul is no longer bound by laws of extension it could be very large, be very small, it could transport itself from place to place very rapidly. It could also begin to be in several places at one time. So its knowledge was more extensive and better informed. Since after death a soul uses its extrasensory perception, the Ike Papalua was also again unrestrained. It could know the thoughts of others telepathy, know the presence of things in other places, clairvoyance, know the future, precognition, and exercise power over matter in various ways, psychokinesis. Its knowledge was still somewhat localized, however, Hawaiians did not attribute cosmic knowledge to spirits. So they're just Uhuani, the soul, and the Akua consciousness of that spirit, that spirit consciousness, gains mana and it's able to do these things the oh, uhane could take other forms it could assume forms of animals plants minerals meteorological phenomenon at will if the soul was accepted as an ancestral god amakua <clears throat> if the soul it indwelt some form nature form like a shark or a bird and if it went to dwell in that realm it was given the nature form of that divinity the soul could dwell in several forms at the same time so this uhane of a person can become an akua with gathering of mana and the chiefs they would propel into uh, a divine status by accumulating the bones even having the the kahuna pray mana into the bones so it elevated the the deceased ali'i, the chief, into uh, a mini god. Much like uh, Caesar became divine Caesar and uh, the pharaohs and that kind of thing, that would happen with the ali'i. But for the common person, spirits of the deceased retained an attachment to an identity with their bones. So after death, while the spirit was still weak, hovering around the place of death, the body was baked until fresh flesh separated from the bones. Then the bones were cleaned and put into a bundle, a puolo, or woven casket. The spirit then encouraged to return into the bones where it could be, have a permanent home with familiar surroundings. It was offered food and drink, promised daily feeding. Then were the prayers imparted, mana, spiritual energy, to the spirit. The spirit entered the bones again, daily feeding, imparting mana through prayer, enabled it to become a powerful akua, who could be called upon, commanded, to protect and help its keeper, the one who fed it. And the others who had the right to call upon it, the spirit called back into its bones, and deified in this way is called a Unihi Pili. Unihi Pili. So, whenever you have ho'o, H-O-O, in front of a Hawaiian word, it means to make. To make. Pono is good. Ho'o Pono, to make good. Ho'o Pono Pono is to make very good. Pono Pono. But ho'o mana mana is to make lots of mana so it's imparting mana to the core in this deification practice now you know it, it, it can be done with uh, common people but with the elites it went to that little mini god thing the ho'o mana mana genre of deification is a hawaiian innovation so the marquesan like a thousand a.d around in a thousand a.d 
migrated to the Hawaiian Islands here. This was the first peoples on the Hawaiian Islands, Marquesa. So that's about a thousand AD. And a little later, the Tahitians came over and there was a, a merge. Marquesans came over, they had deities as well. Their deities were, well, they had already had mana. So they brought mana with them. But when you ho'o mana mana, the Hawaiians were the ones to innovate that. They're the ones that brought that up. So the ho'o mana mana genre of deification is a Hawaiian innovation. It's based upon several underlying principles, all of which represent distinctions in traditional Polynesian thought made by the Hawaiians. The first of these is that the divinities are the same in nature as all other spirit consciousnesses, akua, found throughout the cosmos. The second is that mana is the enhancing power that enables akua to perform in preternatural, supernatural, or supernatural manner. With the fullness of mana comes extensive knowledge, wider ranging precognition, teleportation, control over matter, greater ability to assume multiple forms. The third is what distinguishes divinities from other akua is the amount of mana they possess. The fourth is that mana is a body of spiritual power that may be drawn upon and directed by those with the right or gift to do so. And the fifth is that mana can be transferred into the possession or control of others, such as a deified spirit, the Unihi Pili, putting the mana into the Uhane ghost, becoming an Akua. So if this spiritual power may be drawn upon and, direct, and directed those with the right gift to do so, isn't that a little bit like the saints and heaven and pouring forth of the Holy Spirit and uh, see the saints aren't doing that stuff. God's doing it and God's doing it by God's spirit, the Holy Ghost. So this parallel, I'm not saying they're the same thing. Let me say that right off the bat. It's not, I'm not to say that equals that. No, I'm just saying there's parallels comparative religion. So Akua Mana and Akua Ho'o Mana Mana. In Hawaii, the way that a god acquires his mana became the differentiating characteristic among the gods. The ancient gods who were brought in with the first immigration from the Marquesans were called Akua Mana, gods already possessing mana. Those deified by the Hawaiians were called Akua Ho'o Mana Mana. Gods caused to have mana. They, gods who the mana was made on them. The high gods, Kane, Ku, Lono, Kanaloa, and Hina, were not thought to differ in a fundamental nature from the Ho'o Mana Mana gods. Over the centuries, a large number of myths, some of which contradicted others, were associated with their names. Overlapping realms of responsibility were also ascribed to them and their personages became very complex. But there was never anything in the conception of the high gods, plural, which required that they be any more than spirit consciousness, the Akua, freed from all bodily constraints who had very great mana. And this is from Man, Gods, and Nature, Richard Keone Dudley, PhD. There's a picture. Uh, is that a fair comparison? I don't know. I mean, I think there's something to say that there's parallels. And now this is something that maybe I'm just speculating. Maybe the nature of God and God's spirit and God's incarnation, Jesus Christ, 
these events that happened in our human time and space and history are kind of more timeless and they have a way of existing in other cultures already now there's not a direct parallel there but there's a mana and holy spirit or paraclete do have seemingly to me parallel they have a, a coinciding of characteristic in a sense <sighs> and perhaps that's a little why the Christianity was uh, uh, so appealing with the early missionaries it, it made sense to the Hawaiians the idea of holy and saints and amakua which is a guardian akua and we have guardian angels in Catholicism and I'm starting to be more and more into this that's an interesting thought this guardian angels thing and I have other official uh, Vatican written books on these things too I might share a couple things but you know this one in here is only basically what the Catholic Church teaches that's what they profess to teach that is the catechism other than that just means heretical which just simply means oh we don't teach that <laughs> so in all in all is the Holy Spirit mana I think there's parallels and I think in if God's everywhere and created everything then maybe it's just the same thing looked at from a different perspective a different culture and it's just I don't know food for thought Vini Sancti Spiritus anyways that's all I have sorry for the long lecture I just thought I'd try something different something in the way that's kind of spiritual supernatural and kind of has the spirit of truth being this is a area of religious concepts that people really do hold as true in their belief and um, you know I do go by the Roman Catholicism in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit Paraclete and it's an interesting it's interesting it can be mind-boggling but I think it's kind of a comfort and I just thought I'd share that so aloha and hope you all doing well Till next time. Bye.